Hey there friends, Dave Politis, k and Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And uh, this is a letter segment, and this is going to be a pretty good one, i got to say. So hang in there, and uh, I'll kind of tell you how this evolved today. Sometimes I think my life is structured for me. It, it just seems like things fall into place sometimes that are just bizarre. Today, I got a letter, and I'm going to be very general about it because the person asked me not to talk about it, so I'm not going to talk about anything specifically, but the person contacted me and had a relative that was having huge mental health issues, and they were at a crossroads about what to do, and they asked me for some ideas, and their issue hit very close to home with Ben and I actually stopped a couple times while I was writing the email to the person I think I have some insight that some people don't have just because I've, I've lived it. And thinking about mental health and family members, it just tears up my soul to think that other people are going through this and you're just lost about where to go, what to do, who to talk to. The mental health systems in, in the world are horrible. We don't have enough guidance and enough support to help people. And to find the easy answers about what to do about one of the most complex issues that you'll ever face as a, a relative, a parent, a friend, just tore me apart. Just This person just asked me for some ideas and some help. And I sat down and I talked to him via email and I hope it did some good but it's those kind of things that, that just make me sit back in my chair at my desk and think about how meaningless some things we do in life really are because I know this person is at a cross crossroads in their life and if they lost this person they were writing to me about, it would essentially be the end of their world. And I know some of you have written to me and said, Dave, I, we just can't handle the depression and the, the sad times that you talk about. This is so prevalent in our world today. Some of you have no idea. And I doubt there's one of you out there that don't know somebody who's having mental health issues. Just mere depression. So I thought about this for about 40 minutes as I wrote it. I prayed for them, this person because I need help. And then the very next email I opened is what I'm going to read to you next. And it's not depressing. It's extraordinary. It involves a man in Australia. This is the man. He's since passed away. This man was a saint. You just don't see the halo over his head. But let me read this to you. The title of the article is How This Man Saved 160 People From Suicide. It's on a website called personalexcellence.co. Today I want to share someone inspiring with you. His name is Don Ritchie. And he saved 160 lives in his lifetime. That's not 
That's just the official estimate. The real number is said to be about 400, according to his family. Don passed away May 13, 2012. How did he do that? Don happened to live near a location called The Gap, an ocean cliff in Sydney, Australia. It's a popular visitor destination, which has gained infamy as a suicide spot over the years. It's estimated that about 50 people end their lives there every year. As individuals walk up to the cliff, looking at the crashing waves below and wondering whether to jump, Don would approach them with a smile asking, why don't, you have, why don't you just come with me and have a cup of tea? Accepting his offer, these people would be invited into his home where they would have a chat over tea. No counseling, no advising, no prying. Just one human being lending another a listening ear. Some of these people had mental problems. Some had medical illnesses. Some are just people going through a rough patch in life. For many, a listening ear was apparently what they needed as they changed their minds about jumping after the chat and turned one home. Over the years, whether it's 160 or 260 or somebody talking about 400 the other night, I've spoken to many, many of them just that way, he said. What are you doing over here? Please come talk to me. Come over and have a cup of tea. Come on, come on over and have a beer. Or something like that to get them away from their mind away from going over the cliff while I was there and that's the selling of the idea of coming over and to talk about it tell me why what are you worried about a big percentage of them came and talked to me Don did this for almost 50 years talking to people who walked up to the cliff and were contemplating suicide, extending a helping hand, giving them a listening ear. saving countless from suicide in the process. One woman whom Don and his wife saved would write back or visit about once a year, letting them know that she was happy and well. In 2006, Don was awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia for service to the community through programs to prevent suicide. Him and his wife, Moya, were named Citizens of the Year for 2010 by Woolahura City Council, the local government authority responsible for the gap. He also received the Local Hero Award for Australia in 2011. Don died in 2012 at the ripe old age of 88. Don didn't manage to save everyone in his time, naturally. Some were already gone by the time he rushed to the cliff. Some rejected his invitation and jumped. I can't imagine seeing that as he did many times. I can't imagine it. Sometimes he would climb over the fence and forcibly hold them while Moya called the police. Once it almost cost him his life. As the woman tried to launch herself over the side, with Don being the only thing between her and the abyss. Yet Don didn't weigh himself down with those that he lost. He said that he could not remember the first suicide he witnessed, and none had plagued his dreams. That's a godsend. He did his best with each person. And if he lost one, He accepted that there was nothing more he could have done. What could we learn from Don's story? 
sometimes in our very busy life. We tend to forget about people, the people who need help, who are just trying to do their best to get by, who are facing their own stresses and worries. The people who are next to us or are behind the computer screens at the receiving end of the email messages or are donning official roles and titles but are people nonetheless. We may sometimes forget that these are people. Sometimes we may think of them as objects to help us get things done. Or we may think of them as people who have it all together. And it doesn't matter what we say to them or how we treat them. They can deal with their own issues and emotions as we have our own problems to deal with. Yeah, it's, it's true. But that ain't true. Every human being is a person. A person with feelings, thoughts, aspirations, fears, and responsibilities, commitments. Just as we're struggling with our problems, the person next to us, opposite us, or at the other side of the world using the internet to communicate with us also has their own problems that they are struggling with. Just because people aren't screaming about their issues or aren't walking around with a tag saying they are stressed or frustrated doesn't mean that they don't have their problems. So how about stopping to show some kindness to a fellow person? I say this all the time in my videos. It doesn't cost anything to be nice. It doesn't cost anything to smile, say hello. Can I help you with something? I, I can't think about the number, I don't know the number of times I've helped people in the last year that I've seen. Some things you can do. Send a simple text to check on how a friend is doing. Start a conversation with someone. Give a smile to a stranger or service staff. Give a hug. Give a genuine compliment to someone who did good work. Give someone a call to say hi. Lend a helping hand to someone who has a problem. For example, if you have a friend who is trying to find a job, see if they need help with the resume or if they need pointers on a job search. Or if you knew someone who has just went through a breakup, see if they need a listening ear and want to hang out. Send a thank you note to someone who made a difference in your life. Give a tip to someone who gave great service. So the funny thing about today's world is that when you try to be friendly and kind, some people may think you're crazy. Some may react adversely and push you aside. Some may be busy and not be able to take you up on your offer. Well, that doesn't mean they won't do it take a rain check. But there will be some people who will need the care and love right now, right when you show it. Perhaps they don't even know that they need it. Perhaps they may push you away your offer of kindness, only to take it up soon after. Perhaps they will react with shock as they never thought someone would care, and then gracefully reciprocate. For these people, your small act will make a world of a difference. You may think it doesn't matter, but it does make a big difference to them. Just as Don's little invitation for tea and a chat may seem inconsequential to practical people of the material world, such human touch and empathy is exactly what is missing in our world today. You may know whose life you may change in that process, and perhaps in doing so, you may end up changing your life too. read that twice. It's a big deal to see somebody die. It's a big deal. And Don and his wife put themselves out there to try to help people they never knew to try to be that one person in a million to save somebody at a time of great depression you just don't need that that person in life very often you know you look at him he just looks like a good soul.
know what? He was sincere. We need more of those people in this world. We do. I think about the letter I wrote today, the email. And I think, well, that, that took me out of commission for an hour at least, maybe a couple hours. And then I thought, don't be selfish, you idiot. The person you were addressing He's in the middle of the biggest depressive segment of his life. It snaps me out of it. It does. And more of us need to step up to the plate like, like this. So. His name was Don, Don Ritchie. And that website again was uh, personalexcellence.co. The title of the article, How This Man Saved 160 People from Suicide. Okay, back to the normal everyday letters. Hello, Dave. This happened to me when I was a young kid in 1980, but I can still see every detail in my mind to this day. We had just moved into a house in Alderwood Manor, Washington, that was built in the early 1900s, which was on an old orchard property in a fairly rural area. I was in my upstairs bedroom for the night, but I still had my light on and not ready to sleep. I saw movement which, which caught my eye, so I looked up at the wall in front of me to see what I knew at the time to be a caveman. He was stocky almost completely covered in heavy gray and brown fur that looks more like thick wiry hair like an ape would have. His posture was slumped forward and he was on a walk entering in through the wall on my left and exiting through the wall on my right. Every time he would exit to the right he would then instantly re-emerge on the left and start the course over and over and over again. The problem is that my door to exit the room was on the right side of the same wall on the path of the caveman. The adrenaline was paralyzing and my arms and legs felt heavy and almost electrocuted. I remembered screaming and yelling at the top of my lungs which felt like an eternity to start the sound coming from my voice. Even more terrifying is that now due to my screaming and yelling, I then started to get the attention of this thing. And on his passes through the wall, he started to now pause his steps halfway through and slowly turn his head in my direction. He would never turn his head on the way to look at me, but just enough to let me know that he knew I was there. He was tall, but nothing over seven feet with the slump he had. He had a heavy brow and a huge sloped head. The whole thing ended and vanished when my parents rushed upstairs to see what the problem was. I lived in a house until I was 16 years old, and I had a few other experiences that are equally intense. And so did my younger brother and two sisters. I had a hard time sleeping in that house and never wanted to be alone. If I was left alone, I would leave and go to a friend's house if I could. My buddy told me about your YouTube channel and I was really intrigued. He was explaining to me about this portal theory. I am an elk hunter who hunts alone from time to time. Me and my buddy built a cabin in the Rim Rock area of Washington State, and I think I might have to stop listening to your missing stories if I want to keep hunting out there. I do have a spot location device, at least. Thanks for your show. So, spot devices very similar to a personal locator beacon it's a it's a good device it works well <laughs> with that device you have to pay a monthly fee most personal locator beacons you do not you just pay a flat fee 
Hey Dave, your letters video is great. Well, that's what I'm doing right now. What a way to engage with your community and have your community engage with you. I think it's a great idea and I hope it's successful for all of us. Well, this is the third letter segment I've done and it's questionable <laughs> if it's gonna work. The viewership is not that good. But I'm going to keep going and try and see if I can build the audience here. I share many of your interests presented. I have so many questions for you, things you can't answer in writing or in your videos. That's why I hope to meet you someday and chat directly. Stephen Greer, for example, I wonder about that guy. You obviously know more than I, but there's something that sets my spidery senses off about it. Maybe I'm wrong. Stephen Greer, a UFO researcher, done a lot of movies, has the same distribution company as my, uh, my films do. Stephen believes that all aliens, extraterrestrials, are harmless and friendly. If you've watched Missing 41, The UFO Connection, you may have a different view. I've never met him, never talked to him. And Dave, on dousing, my grandpa taught me how to do that when I was a little guy. He was incredible. After he found and buried a water source, pipe, power line, etc., location, he could come in on an angle and find the direction of the flow as the rods moved in the direction. He could also tell how deep the source was based on walking away from the spot of the rods would cross at a certain point, away from the source point, and that distance was how deep it was to the ground. He was incredibly accurate, especially when finding breaks on the farm that needed to be repaired. Amazing stuff that if you and Angie give it a try with a water hose, I suggest you attempt dousing blindfolded. Start so as not to be influenced by the rods. You know, I'm not that talented. <laughs> Angie could probably do it, but I couldn't do it, I don't think. Next letter. Hey Dave, I'm writing again to offer my encouragement for what it's worth. The reading of letters is an integral part of each of your copyrighted missing person segments, and I'd be sorry to see the letters go. I chose the subject letters and more because what you refer to as letters are much more than that. Facts, articles, stories, information, comments, observations are all included in the letters portion of each of your missing person segments. If, and I say if advisedly, there's a reluctance by some of the villagers to listen to the letters. It may be simply a matter of the term not encompassing the entirety scope of the information to be covered under the heading letters. That portion may need to be titled at all as it is a preface or precursor for the tax regarding missing people. So my vote would be not to classify the wealth of information simply as letters. That said, what you refer to as stories are to me, just my opinion, cases, real life missing persons cases. As I think of a story as a yarn or a tale, since when I was a kid in the 50s, we were taught that stories were not necessarily facts. The story of Little Red Riding Hood, the story of the three bears, etc. I hate to see you discouraged by man's inhumanity unkindness, lack of respect, failure to give credit where credit is due, unthankfulness, lack of grace, to just name a few. You deserve more respect than that, sir. Funny, but I wrote all of the extemporaneously when I had originally written to simply share a quick thought, which you inspired on the missing person case I watched you discussing last night. You said that the shoes and socks of the gentleman who went missing and has not been found were left behind at the man's house. You also read a letter from a viewer suggesting that grounding is possibly involved with portals, suggesting that a barefooted person may be easily able to pass through a portal since there is no insulation on his feet. Why am I writing is, is that just a few days ago, Steve Isdall wrote, now Steve Isdall read an email on his show in which a viewer told how he had observed a man, perhaps an older Native American, a repairman entered the backyard of a home where there were two large protective watchdogs snarling. 
the repairman first removed one of his shoes and threw it into the yard with the dogs. The dogs sniffed the shoe, then acquiesced, and the man entered through the gate, and the dogs hardly paid attention. When asked how he was able to quiet the dogs down, he stated that dogs can read your intentions by smelling your feet. He said that feet are what a dog will sniff first on a visitor. Of course you have Huck, so you can check out the veracity of the claim. I just found it interesting that there could be any correlation between the smell of our feet and our intentions, and the number of missing shoeless people makes any relevance to bare feet even more intriguing. Now that is fascinating. Never heard that before. I've got to think back of all the time when I was doing police work and the shoes. It's really a good one. <laughs> Thank you. I had a thought that relates to the link between the sightings of Bigfoot and the correlation of sightings of UFOs, but forgive me if this has already been expressed before. I think three elements come into play. Firstly, it is clear that the beings behind UFO visitation clearly have taken an interest in the human race and are at least curious as to what we get up to. Certainly, your research on the missing 411 proves their interest may go beyond their curiosity. But there are 7 billion humans. It's quite possible we wouldn't miss one or two disappearing or being interfered with. Now, Sasquatch. Witness reports and evidence, not at least from our buddy, Les Stroud, testify to their unique and paranormal abilities with telepathy, telepathy and physical movement, among other things. As a species of hominid, then, would this make them more interest and curiosity to intelligent beings and even ourselves? Would not aliens take particular interest in Bigfoot for these reasons? And then the numbers. How many Sasquatch are there? Certainly not billions, probably not millions. So the odds, odds of observing a UFO in the vicinity of the, with the species with low numbers and distribution greatly increases. Let's go back. Would not aliens take interest in Bigfoot for these reasons? Yeah. I suppose I was given the ability to study many topics simultaneously. And I've always been that way. Like I was interested in Bigfoot. I was interested in UFOs. I was interested in a lot of things on the periphery. And I read a ton when I was younger. I'd get home from police work sometimes at 3 in the morning and be pretty jacked up and awake and I'd start reading a book and after 30, 45 minutes I'd be tired and fall asleep so that's when I did my reading. But Bigfoot and aliens. Do you know that there are, have been many abductees that have claimed that they've seen a Bigfoot type creature on the craft with the aliens and the aliens were directing the Bigfoot so it seemed to be subservient to the aliens. Not just once or twice, there's a lot of these stories. And that's where I come back to, is it multidimensional? Can it access a portal? Is it alien itself? And if I were your intention to preserve Sasquatch for observation, I would draw a parallel between ourselves and polar bears. When one approaches human territory, we pick up and transport it elsewhere. Maybe this then explain why Bigfoot are suddenly observed in the same time and the same location as these alien craft. They are engaged in species observation and preservation. See, I think of it as the aliens are dropping them off to do their territorial work. This would also explain the observations of Sasquatch in very unlikely and unnatural locations around the world. Perhaps they do not migrate there. Perhaps they were released there. Giddy up. Anyway, as ever, take care, enjoy your summer. So-and-so from the UK. Thank you for that. So as one of the people said in the letters today, letters are a lot more than just letters. I think tonight was like the perfect way to explain what these letters are. There's so much more. 
And as I've stated to you many times, I think a lot of the answers on many of our issues have come either directly or indirectly from the letters that are written. One thing that Angie and I have talked about many times is that the audience that watches this channel, super smart people, with a lot of insight, and I greatly appreciate you for that. And again, my goal is not to make this a depressing channel, just the opposite. So it's a research channel. But it's also about the trials and tribulations of life. And right now, there's a lot of challenges in life. And so I'll keep talking about these things. I won't make it a central focus. But if it's anything like the emails I get, then we're helping people here as a group. And I hope everyone reads the comments at the bottom of these videos. Because there's a compassion level in the villagers that really resonates. I've gotten it to the point where I think we've weeded out a lot of the bad apples who are mean and use bad words and aren't sensitive. We've got a pretty safe harbor here. So as a group, we should use that. Further communicate and tell others that this is a safe harbor. Lastly, please subscribe. If you're not a subscriber, please do. I know a lot of you have told me that YouTube doesn't tell you when there's a new video coming up. Suffice it to say, within the next month, I hope to have a, a video up here every other day. And for the last couple of weeks, it's been that way. My summer is super busy and there's a lot of things I, I've committed to do and for a multitude of tasks. So be patient with me. We'll work together. Try to entertain each other here. Try to do some research together. You have them watch Missing 411, The UFO Connection. Our first movie, Missing 411, or our second movie, Missing 411, The Hunted. You can watch almost all of them via Amazon. A few of them are on YouTube right now. I hope Ben meets Mr. Ritchie. Light us up.